Lord, we seek your help now. For you are truly the God of wonders. You are the God who saves. You are the God who provides. So Lord, we look to you. Grant to us what we need, Lord. Our eyes open to behold wondrous things. Lord, show us your strength. Show us your power. Mesmerize us with the beauty and splendor of your word. Captivate our hearts. Lord, help us to see you and to be changed, to transform for the glory of your name and for the good of the next generation to come, we pray. Amen. Amen. But do you guys remember a couple weeks ago, Pastor Jeff randomly mentioned in one of his sermons the painter Bob Ross? Do you guys remember that? Yeah. So, there I was on a Monday afternoon, eating my lunch, minding my own business, and suddenly I found myself, along with my son Ian, glued to our iPad screen, watching a 25-minute video of Bob Ross do some magic. I was mesmerized by this guy with a half-unbuttoned shirt and some puffy hair and some Prussian blue and titanium white and Van Dyke brown take a white canvas and just transform it into this incredible winter cabin scene. It was, it was pretty wonderful. And when the show was over, I started thinking to myself, like, who is Bob Ross? Like, how did he get here? What's his story? How did he get a show on PBS? And so I did a little investigating. And before too long, I uh, found out that he had been an avid painter beforehand. And one day while he was working, he, he came across this show called The Magic of Oil Painting by William Bill Alexander. It was this German painter. And he had perfected this uh, particular type of painting. And so when Bob Ross sh- saw that video, he immediately left his work and ran to go get trained under Bill Alexander to learn his craft. So I thought, well, that's pretty cool. Well, that's really great. So I decided to check out who Bill Alexander is. Who is William Alexander? I wonder what his show is like. And when I clicked on that and it started... It literally stunned me. Like, I couldn't believe what I saw. Here was this guy, the same pose, the same palette, telling me to grab the same colors with the same brush. He had the same white canvas in front of him, and his show was called The Magic of Oil Painting. So in other words, I'm literally looking there, and I'm like, that's Bob Ross, but it's not Bob Ross is an entire different guy, but it's, it's like if they just took a, another guy and subbed him out for Bob Ross. It was great. You know, Scripture says that a student is not above his master, but when he's fully trained, he's just like his teacher. And I was seeing just that. Here was a man who had set himself under one teacher's particular ways, and he was reflecting it right before my eyes. I thought to myself, that has to be one of the clearest examples of discipleship that I've ever seen in my entire life. They literally just, it's like the guy replicated himself. Everything that I was seeing on TV seemed exactly the same. I thought that is what it looks like to disciple the next generation. I thought... If only the church was as good as Bill and Bob, the painters, at discipling the next generation. What a different world this would be. What a different experience at church we would have. What a different testimony many of our children would have when they look back on their years growing up in a local church family. If only the church could replicate disciples of Jesus like these guys had. Wow, that would be sweet. I think that we can. I feel like, in fact, we have to be better than them at it. We must be better at discipling 
the next generation. And when you start talking about what does it look like to disciple the next generation, it prompts all kinds of questions. Like, who is responsible to do it? How are we going to go about it? What do we even say to them? What do we, what do we pass down to them? What are the things that are, are going to attack uh, the next generation? What are the, the threats that we're going to have to look out for? How are we going to seek to give to the next generation the truths that God has revealed in such a way that they're captivated by it, not bored by it? In such a way that they go, that's exactly what I want to do. That's exactly the kind of Christian I want to be. That's the kind of faith I want to model. Instead of running as far away as they possibly can. Well, I want to try to answer some of those questions because I believe that verses 1 through 8 of Psalm 78 help us do just that. So over the next couple weeks, we're going to look at discipling the next generation. In fact, we're going to look at six dimensions of discipling the next generation or six different angles that we ought to pursue in discipling, teaching, telling the next generation. I'm going to give us three this week. We're going to look at three next week. The three today that we'll consider are these. The commitment that we make, the responsibility we share, and the wonders we proclaim. The commitment we make, the responsibilities we share, and the wonders that we proclaim. Let's consider our first point. The commitment that we make. You know, Asaph, who wrote Psalm 78, started off his song by calling his audience to undivided attention. And he pledged himself, and he kind of voluntold his whole generation, he pledged himself to faithfully disciple the next generation. This wasn't some random fleeting idea he had. This wasn't some New Year's resolution that was going to fade away in a couple weeks. Asaph based this on tradition and on conviction. And he said in verse For we will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation. The commitment that Asaph was making and that he was calling his entire generation of believers to make was we will not hide, but we will tell. That word hide in verse 4 is a play on words. Asaph's not only making a commitment, but he's doing so in a clever way. See, the phrase hide means dark sayings of old. In verse 2, it refers to these puzzling riddles, which the meaning was hidden and it needed to be discovered. So we've, we've talked about it before, but remember, history's lessons are kind of hidden in all of the facts. They're hidden in plain sight. And it requires somebody to put the accounts alongside one another, which is what the word parable means, alongside each other. So that the stories are seen then in high def. The patterns become clear. You begin to see the consistencies and the links. And the principles for life then become practical and available. And so what Asaph's saying, he's saying, well, I'm going to do that. I'm, I'm not going to hide the things of history. I'm not going to hide the things passed down to me. I'm going to tell them. He essentially says, I'm not going to play hide and seek with what's been given to me. Now, I don't know about you, but growing up playing hide-and-seek, did you enjoy that game? Yeah. My kids really like to play hide-and-seek. The problem is that dad is really competitive. Dad doesn't like to lose. And so dad likes to play hide-and-seek, but don't find, (laughs) because that means I win, right? And that's what it's about, me winning, of course. Well, other parents have told me that it's discouraging for kids to play hide-and-seek and and never find. It's not a very fun game when all you're doing is looking, but you're never actually obtaining. Church, when we close our Bibles and when we close our mouths, we play hide-and-seek with the next generation. No, we play hide-and-seek and never find with the next generation. We leave off these beautiful truths that have been passed down to us Because we close our mouths and we close our Bibles. We end up leaving our kids hidden in the dark. And so what Asaph's saying is, no way. I'm not playing hide and seek. I am committed to show and tell, though. He says in verse 4, he's going to tell 
the coming generation. That's a present, active, plural participle. In other words, it means we all are going to keep on telling the next generation. We're going to keep talking about it. We're going to never shut up about it. Because what has been told to us by our fathers, we will keep telling to ensure that God's truth is passed down to the next generation. Now, I see a common mentality in America, and especially in the American church, be curious if it's pervasive here, this common mentality that says, my faith is a personal and a private thing. And so I, I'm not going to talk to other people about it, and I don't think you should talk to other people about it. Well, sure, we can acknowledge that there are personal and private parts of our faith that are very precious to us. And yet, and yet, if we don't go public with our faith, if we don't go public with God's truths, then we are not in line with this text. And if we're not in line with this text, then we're not committed to making disciples. And church, hear me clearly. If you are not committed or interested in making disciples, there's legitimate grounds to question whether you are a disciple of Jesus or not. Because that's what disciples do. That's what Jesus told us to do. So if you say you're a disciple, but you're not making disciples, you're not interested in that, then we don't know really what you mean by making disciples or what you mean by being a disciple. Church, God is so concerned with faithfulness in each generation so that there's faith in the next generation that he has Asaph right down here. Don't play hide and seek. Make sure that you're practicing show and tell. And so by way of application, I have to ask you, are you committed? Cornerstone, have you made the commitment to disciple the next generation? Have you settled it in your heart? Have we collectively as a church family settled it in our heart that allows us to pledge and resolve today we will not hide God's truth, but we will tell it to the generation to come. You start talking about resolving and, and committing. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to engrave that kind of conviction in the stone of our hearts. When you start talking about loyalty to the task, devotion to the mission, it, it makes me wonder, should we expect any lesser loyalty from soldiers of Christ than we would from soldiers in our own military, in our country? Like, who of us would be okay if somebody went up to a soldier who was about to head into battle and go, appreciate the heart, son, appreciate your willingness to do this, but there's no need to be loyal now. Your commitment up to this point was sufficient. You're welcome to go do your own thing. None of us would, no way. <laughs> He's committed to the task. He's resolved to carry out his assignment. Similarly, should we expect a lesser loyalty from the bride of Christ than from a bride on her wedding day? Could you imagine somebody standing up in a ceremony after a bride and groom said their vows or as they're saying their vows and go, whoa, 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 easy on the language. Not so strong with that I will forever kind of talk. Slow down, easy. We go, no way. They are committed to each other. And they're saying, until death does me part. Why should we make any kind of lesser commitment? Or why should we cast off any kind of language that says, no, I'm resolved to carry out the task assigned to me to disciple the next generation? Yes, absolutely we should be marked by humility, knowing we are prone to wander, right? Right? Absolutely, we know that our, our commitments and our resolves, they, they go up and down. Yeah, absolutely. But should we not, by faith, be seeking to carry out what God commands? Expecting that he will supply the grace to do what he commands us to do? Right? If he tells us to do this, will he not also supply what we need to carry that out? Yeah, I think so. 
So church, will you make the commitment? Will we make the commitment to disciple the next generation? Well, commitment's a good step, but it's only the first step. Now, the task is large, and it can't be accomplished alone. I think we understand that. But that's exactly why we see next, in our second point, that discipling the next generation is a responsibility that we share. Discipling the next generation is not only about the commitment we make, but it's, it's a responsibility that we share. What I mean by this is that the duty to make disciples of the next generation is a partnership. It's, it's meant to be a joint effort between the home and the church, between the family and between the body of believers, the local church family. Now, in my own study and reading on this, I, I, I've seen that churches and Christians around the world are, are kind of split or persuaded differently as to what extent that responsibility is shared. Some think that discipleship of the next generation rests entirely on the home. It's up to parents. It's up to fathers, especially to carry that out. Others think that the responsibility to disciple the next generation falls solely upon the church to provide the programs and ministries for discipleship. And then there's a lot who fall somewhere in between. But I think that when we look at God's word, what we see him saying is that the responsibility rests on the shoulders of both church and family. Let me show you from the text why that's the case. Clearly, in verses 3 through 6, Asaph's saying, God is saying, that the next generation being discipled begins at home, primarily the duty of of fathers and parents. Look at verse 3. It says, The things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. So Asaph's saying our dads did this for us. They taught us this. Verse 4, we will not hide them from their children, but tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might, the wonders that he has done. Verse 5, God established a testimony in Jacob, and he appointed a law in Israel. So not only was this God's recommendation, it was his exhortation. It had been inscripturated, and it was commanded that fathers did this which he commanded our fathers to teach their children, that the next generation might know them. So what you see clearly from this text is that it is the primary duty of fathers and parents to begin discipleship for the next generation in their homes. And yet, while it is maybe primarily or definitely the responsibility of parents, to bring up their children in the ways of the Lord, to help them walk in his commands. I don't think that this text says it's exclusively the responsibility of the parents. I think here we learn that there is a corporate, a congregational, a church responsibility as well. I'm convinced of this for several reasons. First, the word fathers in verses 3 and 5 They can not only refer to dads, but it can also be used as a word to refer to an entire generation. We actually see that in other parts of the psalm. Look at verse 8. And that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast. We see that in verse 12. In the sight of their fathers, he performed wonders in the land of Egypt. Now, just thinking back in the Exodus... Did only people with children, did only dads see hail and gnats and blood? Like, no, of course. It's because he's not talking only about dads. He's talking about an entire generation of believers. So we see this word being used to refer to an entire generation, not only dads. Not only here in Psalm 78, but in other parts of the Old Testament. Second, we also see that when Asaph says in verse 4, we will not hide them from our children. He isn't simply saying, we who have kids, we who have young ones in our homes. He's not saying that that's who's going to do it. He's saying we as the current generation of God's covenant people, we the generation of believers. And in this way, he's not relieving fathers of their responsibility as much as he's reinforcing, he's stressing 
that there is a corporate responsibility. The task is given to the entire community of believers to ensure that God's truth gets passed down to those who come after them. The third, we see that the, the coming generation doesn't exclusively refer to kids who grow up in a godly Christian home or in a godly Jewish home in the Old Testament sake. More accurately, it was the entire generation. So I think I'm, the horse is dead, but I'm beating it still. <laughs> Let me bring us back up and kind of wrap it, wrap it up. What we see is that there's a shared responsibility here. Psalm 78 is not an individual song. It's a song about God's people for God's people, past, present, and future. It's in the context of the Psalter, which is used in corporate worship. So that as we read it and sing it and pray it and teach it and study it and learn it and apply it, it is for everybody. It is for all of God's people to carry out this task of ensuring the next generation knows his truths and knows him. So for those reasons, I'm persuaded that God in his wisdom has designed the discipleship of the next generation to be a shared responsibility between family and church. Now to be sure, let me say it clearly, the family is not the church and the church is not the family. They are two different and distinct institutions. On one hand, there is no promise given to the family that the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There is no spiritual giftings to the family of apostles and prophets and teachers and preachers and shepherds and servants who are to do the equipping of the saints for the work of the ministry. Those promises are given to the church. And likewise, the church does not have the same kind of ability to nurture from infancy all the way to old age the kind of emotional and spiritual and relational bonds that a family can, that can continue the process of discipleship long after a, a child is out of the home, but can continue it all the way down in the years that they live. So to, to summarize, it, I, I think that both family and church, being distinct, have respect have roles and responsibilities that should be respected and appreciated and some lines that should never be crossed. Yet, we realize that when family and church are together, there's so much more that can be done to ensure that God reaches his next generation for the glory of his name. That he would use us, a joint effort, as a means by which his truth would be passed on. We are meant to serve as co-laborers, working alongside one another toward the same goal. And you could put it this way. I kind of have D-Day on my mind. I've been reading some World War II books, so I'm thinking along the lines. But the, I think what God's intent is kind of like that, in that this is to produce an, an allied type of effort that would wage war on the beaches of young hearts and young souls, and that we would do it with arms linked together, avoiding any kind of friendly fire, but instead charging forward together. So Cornerstone, how are you doing with your share of the responsibility? I would ask you, are you carrying your own weight in your family? Are you carrying your appropriate weight in the family of disciples here? Or have you fled your post? Are you lying down on the job? Church, what can you be doing at home to better support the discipleship ministries of the church? And what can the church be doing better to support you and your discipleship efforts at home and with those with whom you meet? If you'd allow me to ask a few more invasive questions, <laughs> I think it would do us well. And I want to start with pastors. I want to start with the elders first. I think we need to take a good, honest look as pastors of Cornerstone. Pastor Jeff, 
Ken, David, myself? Are we busy making disciples or are we just busy? If we're just busy doing things, but we're not actually doing the assignment of what we're supposed to be doing, are we not getting tripped up and caught up? We're not being faithful then. I think another question we ought to ask ourselves is, in what ways have we allowed those entrusted to our care call themselves disciples of Jesus, but remain uninterested in making disciples? Or remain unsure about how to actually go about it? Or to let them show up Sunday after Sunday, and yet, as they listen to sermons, allow them to be unengaged, boots on the ground, making disciples with, of others throughout the week? What do we need to change to better help you do your call? I think we also have to ask, is there any way in which our ministry methodology is unintentionally hindering discipleship in our homes instead of helping it? What changes do we need to make? Fathers, I turn my crosshairs to you. I ask you, have you accepted or have you abdicated once again your responsibility as the spiritual shepherd in your home? had a lot of sermons exhort us as men as fathers to embrace this calling men how are you doing in that grandpas how are you doing in that spiritual fathers of spiritual sons how are you doing in that mothers are is there any way in which you've been distracted by many good things from the best thing of making disciples. Church, will we act upon these duties in Christ's strength? Let's do that together. Church, I think it's also important for us to ask this question. Have we become a people who are willing to send our own kids into the gym for discipleship and yet who aren't willing to go into the gym to disciple one another's kids. There are nearly 400 of us, and we cannot find enough servants to teach the young kids. Church, how can that be? How can that be? There should be a waiting list for who's teaching the next generation. And certainly, church, should we consider that have we become a people who are so committed to sometimes keeping our kids in the service, we value that of having them worship with us, that we unintentionally overlook the opportunities to go teach them how to disciple other people, how to live lives of service in the church community. Our church cannot, must not be a place where you just come and you listen to sermons. It must be a field in which all servants are making disciples and all disciples are serving. We must not let our homes Simply be places where we live and spend our time. Our homes must be gardens that are growing disciples of Jesus. Church, I want to encourage you. Think about the ways this week that you need to align your life with God's design. Where are you out of balance in this shared responsibility individually? And church, let me know. Where do you feel like we are out of balance as a church family with regard to God's design for us in making disciples? We want to grow in this. We want to press on in this. We want to be faithful in this. We want to share the responsibility together. So church, when it comes to telling the generation to come, let's labor together. Let's embrace this shared responsibility responsibility. And that leads us to our last point, our third point, the wonders that we proclaim. 
if we're going to make the commitment to disciple the next generation, and if we're going to share in this responsibility to tell them, the question becomes, what should we tell them about? What do we even do? What do we say? Well, Asaph tells us in verses 4 through 7. Read those with me. He says, we will not hide them. Well, what is them? We'll see. From their children. But tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might, the wonders that he has done. Oh, he established a testimony in Jacob, a law in Israel. He commanded our fathers to teach their children. Why? That the next generation might know them. What is them? It's the glorious deeds and his wonders. The children yet unborn and arise and tell them. What is them? It is the glorious deeds and wonders of God. Why? Verse 7, that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God. Keep his commandments. So in other words, the wonders of God, the works of God, are what the fathers spoke to their children, what Asaph's generation was to never forget, but to remember, and what they were to pass on. And it is what you and I, and every future generation of God's people, are to proclaim so that his wonders and works won't be forgotten. So what are these wonders and works? Let me, let me try to help you understand what they are and why they matter as we wrap up. The works and wonders describe these historic moments when God flexed his muscles. They were events of incredible and explosive power. Many that were witnessed with their eyes and then written down. And that's really where you get this relationship between the works of God and the word of God. We'll kind of see a little bit more next week. But there are specific words throughout the Psalms that these Hebrew authors used because the wonders of God, the works of God, are in a category of their own. They they use phrases like the praises of the Lord, the praiseworthy and glorious deeds, wonders, marvels, marvelous things, wonderful works, mighty acts, signs and wonders, the works of his hand, his arm, his right arm. And they all describe God's power to create, his power to save, and his power to provide. What you see are these snapshots of glory, glimpses of incredible and unforgettable power. We see them in creation We see them in salvation. We see them in provision. And those, church, you can read all about them in Psalm 78 and throughout the Psalter. They are so significant. And they are so significant for this reason. They're like God's highlight tape. They're like his highlight reel. You might realize and and know that it's common for sports teams or for athletes to create a compilation of their best plays, of their, of their best um, catches or throws or something, something that highlights their ability. It showcases what they really can do. And they hope that somebody would watch that video and go, whoa, that guy's good. That gal can play. We want her on our team. We want him to come to our school. Well, church, These wonders of God, these works of God, they're they're like his highlight reel. It's like his top (laughs) ten. They're these stunning moments of miraculous might, and they're meant to make us go, no way. Are you kidding me? He does that? Are you serious? Wow. No way. The Psalms tell us what we are to do with these wonders. They say we are to marvel at them. We're to meditate upon them. We're to be grateful for them. We're to never forget them, but to delight in them and to declare them. There's all kinds of verses in the Psalms, but one just catches it so well. Psalm 71, verses 15 through 19. My mouth will tell of your righteous acts, of your deeds of salvation all the day. For their number is past my knowledge, and with mighty deeds of the Lord, God, I will come. 
I will remind them of your righteousness, yours alone. And then I love this. Listen to this. Oh God, from my youth you have taught me, and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, oh God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those to come. For, oh God, your righteousness reaches the high heavens. You have done great things, O oh God, who is like you. Wow, that's beautiful. Beautiful. From infancy to gray hairs, let me proclaim the wonders of God. Church, here's what you can't miss. The wonders of God are proclaimed. They're loved. They're cherished. They're sung about. They are told. They are preached because the wonders of God are meant to show us the God of wonders. They are not ends in themselves, but they are to point to the God who creates, who saves, and who provides. And each display of power is a glimpse of glory that more beautifully shows us who God truly is and what he can do. And is it no surprise then, church, that, that wonders of wonders is not an, an exodus out of Egypt, though that's the granddaddy of them all in the Old Testament. Wonders of wonders is not merely manna from heaven and quails and water from a rock Wonders of wonders is that the creator enters into his creation to bring about salvation and make provision for earth's most sinful people. That through Christ Jesus' perfect life, his law keeping, his never forgetting God's works, his never forsaking his father's will, he then is able to go to the cross and pay for every act of forgetfulness every act of stubborn rebellion that you and I have ever committed. And he pays for them there. And three days later, he rises again in power so that you and I may also taste of that resurrection power and he might provide for us all we need to live this life for him. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. Surely, if people in the Old Testament were captivated by some of those things, should we not be captivated? Should we not see more clearly who God actually is? Not who we think he is, but who he actually is as we look at Christ our Savior. Oh, the wondrous mystery that he is. Church, when we see these wonders and when we reflect upon Christ and his gospel it shows us God's love, his faithfulness, his goodness, his supremacy, his glory and his might. And what does it do to us? It is a life-changing look, isn't it? It is a transforming look. Because when we see them, when the eyes of our heart are enlightened to behold his wonders, then suddenly... Suddenly, our confidence is strengthened. Suddenly, our joy is heightened. Suddenly, we want to obey. Suddenly, we don't want to act like all the past faithless generations. We want to live differently. We want to live for God's glory. Not ungrateful and unbelieving, but thankful and faithful. Church, we will not hide from the coming generation. We'll tell these glorious deeds and wonders. I ask you, will you make the commitment? Will you share in that responsibility? Will you proclaim these wonders? Let me close by just going back to our, our two painters, Bill and Bob, we talked about earlier. In 1982, they made a commercial together in which Bill, that was William Alexander, the German painter, he held his, his big palette in one arm, and he held this massive paintbrush in the other, and he stood there next to Bob Ross, 
And he said in this thick German accent, I hand over this mighty brush to a mighty man, Bob. <laughs> and Bob Ross takes it, grabs that brush, and he says, yeah, we're going to teach all kinds of classes. You can sign up for these art classes. You know, he goes on and on. Cornerstone, whether we want to call it passing the torch, passing the baton, or passing the paintbrush, I don't care. What's important is that we don't pass the buck, but that we get the job done. So will you make that commitment? Will you do your part to share in the responsibility? Will you proclaim the wonders to the next generation? If you do, if so, then we will be disciples of Jesus who are faithful in our generation to faithfully disciple the next. Lord, help us to do that well. Let's pray. Lord, we do turn our hearts to you now. We thank you for the riches of your word. And Lord, we echo the, the words of these psalmists. Lord, we give you thanks for who you are. We give you thanks for your wondrous deeds, and we want to recount them. Yet we know how fickle our hearts are. Lord, we know how prone to wander we are. We know how blind we are. Lord, we know how bored we can get reading our Bibles. Oh, Lord, we know how we can distract from others the true beauty of Christ by the way that we live. Oh, Lord, we want to lay all of those things at your feet and say, Lord, change us. Do with us, do in us what we cannot do in ourselves. Lord, change us and transform us by your glory and your might. Oh, Lord, that the, that the next generation might call upon you. They might know and treasure Jesus with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. Oh, and that even the youngest among us here would walk in your ways. Lord, we ask this in Christ's name. Amen.